Good afternoon, Rosemont Baptist Church. It's good to be here with you uh, as we have rain off and on today. Uh, uh, for those at Rosemont, uh, sad news since last Wednesday, uh, Miss Pat Garrett passed away last week, and we laid her to rest uh, up at uh, next to her husband at Friendship Baptist Church up in Defuniac Springs. We did that this morning, and we had a very nice graveside service for her. Uh, be in be in prayer for the family. Uh, as uh, Pat's going to be missed. Uh, those who knew Pat here, she she always had a smile. She always had a hug, and sometimes she had a joke uh, for everyone here. And uh, she will be greatly, greatly missed. Today, we're moving into the Old Testament book of Micah as we move through the uh, Old Testament, as we're more specifically, uh, over these past number of weeks, we've been going through the minor prophets. So we're getting towards the end of the Old Testament. Uh, the end of the Old Testament. Uh, last week we were looking at Jonah. Today we're looking at Micah. Micah, there's a few verses that are familiar out of here, uh, but this is an interesting book. The book is named, uh, well, before we get started, let me open up and a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, Almighty God, we just thank you for the day that you've given us. Lord, we thank you for your many blessings. And Lord, we ask that your hand of blessings be upon the family of Pat Garrett. And Lord, she will be missed. Be with our study today. Open up our hearts, our minds, our understanding to your word. And may Jesus be glorified for it's in his holy name we pray. Amen. Amen. The book of Micah is named after uh, the, the prophet who wrote it. In fact, most, uh, uh, most scholars believe that uh, Micah did write it. Micah of Morathesheth. We read that over in verse 1. Uh, verse 1, the word of the Lord which came to Micah of Morasheth in the days of uh, Jotham, Adhaz, Ahaz and Hezekiah, kings of Judah, which he saw concerning Samaria and Jerusalem. And, and uh, there are some other uh, more modern, more liberal scholars who believe other people have wrote it because of the number of different sections in here. We'll talk about that in a minute. But I'm going to go with what tradition and what most people believe. They believe that uh, this book was written by the uh, uh, prophet of the same Title. Now, when we look at Micah, Micah was a contemporary. We, we know when he lived, and we know when, uh, when he was prophesying during these kings. He was a contemporary of Isaiah, of Isaiah, uh, but he wasn't in the royal court. He was not in the, uh, in the area where the, um, uh, uh, all the power was being at. He was from the little town of uh, he was from the little town of Morathseth, which is about 25 miles to the south uh, uh, southwest of, of Jerusalem, near Gath, the, the Philistine uh, town of Gath. Uh, it was a, uh, in a fertile area. It was a farming community. It was probably also a lot of sheep herding there, uh, simply because a lot of references to shepherds that were there. But... Uh, it is similar to um, Amos, he was not of, uh, of any recognized group of prophets or somebody that was well known, but he was a prophet that even though this is a small book and it's in the minor prophets, uh, his prophecies are anything but small. Uh, canonization, this was recognized, his writings were recognized early on as being uh, authoritative and from the Lord. Jeremiah, in Jeremiah 26, verse 18, uh, he quotes Micah. Uh, it says, Micah of Morasheth prophesied in the days of Ezekiel, king of Judah. He spoke to all the people of Judah, saying, Thus says the Lord of hosts, has said, Zion 
will be plowed as a field and Jerusalem will become ruins and the mountain of the house as the high places of a forest. Quoting from Micah 3.12. And so here we have Micah being quoted even, even again in the, uh, in the Old Testament. So it's recon recognition as authoritative and as the word of God uh, came very much early on. And although Micah is very similar to Amos in its in its prophecies, uh, it's not in its styles. Though it's uh, it's mostly in terms of poetry, it's not as refined as Amos when we look into the Hebrew and 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 the use. But it has very much uh, uh, very powerful statements of truth contained in it, and it's characterized as we see in a lot of these minor prophets, characterized by messages of judgment. God is bringing judgment on the people. But along with that is the theme of God will also bring restoration to his people. And we see this a common theme throughout all of these different books, whether it's Isaiah, whether it's Daniel, whether it's all of these minor prophets. Uh, we looked at Joel a few weeks ago, Amos, uh, a number of these books. It's a common theme. Must be something to it. We see this theme over and over again. Judgment and restoration. Judgment and restoration. And, and Micah was a... Uh, a, a prophet of prediction. He predicted and he prophesied about a number of events that would happen in the future. And, and most of these events had happened. A number of these events have yet to happen. And, and we have to understand the importance of the prophecies that have happened because they lend credence to the prophecies of those things that have yet to happen. He prophesied the fall of Samaria, the fall of Samaria to Assyria. We know that happened in 722 BC, and we know uh, that Micah had to prophesy at some point prior to that, prior to, to the fall of Samaria. So we, we think he was prophesying probably 780 or there around, uh, thereabouts, uh, certainly earlier. Uh, and we read about the fall of Samaria, chapter 1 here, verses uh, 5 to 7. We read it over in chapter 6, verses 9 to 16. And there's some other things uh, grouped in on that. He prophesies about the fall of Jerusalem to the Babylonians uh, in verses 9 to 16, the latter part of chapter 1. Over in chapter 3, there's a verse. Chapter 4, a few verses as chapter 6 as well. He also prophesied about the return of the Jewish people, the exiled Jewish people, in chapter 2 and chapter 5 and chapter 7. And some of these uh, deal with not only the return after the exile from Babylon, but also the exile and the scattering of the Jews around the world and in the end days as well. Very important in Micah, we have the prophecy about the birthplace of the Messiah, and we read about that in chapter 5, most notably in verse 2. We read about, as we continue to read uh, in chapter 5, about his universal kingdom, about when Jesus comes back again. And then in chapter 4, we also read about the faith, the coming of faith of the Gentile nations. Uh, just as a review class, who are the Gentiles? Uh, that'd be most of us. Anyone who is not Jew, they are Gentile. They are Gentile. Okay, I was checking. We've had some internet problems today, and I was checking to see whether or not we were up, and I guess we are. Um, but the faith, coming of faith of the Gentile nations. Uh, the, as I've mentioned, the date uh, we've, talked about it's uh, uh, probably uh, 800, 780, 760 in that time frame BC, BC. So he's an 8th century prophet. He ministered in the South Kingdom, uh, mostly uh, a lot of it had to do with Israel, but what was happening to Israel would also apply to Judah as well. 
uh, the book is divided into three sections, mostly uh, chapters one and two. We've got chapters three through five and chapters six and seven. Now, the thing that we hear, and this is interesting in here, and I hope you have your Bibles open, but if you look at uh, uh, chapter one, verse two, it says, Hear, O people, all of you, listen, O earth, and all that it contains. That, that sets off each section. Here is the word Shema in the, uh, uh, in the Hebrew language. Uh, the Shema, if you remember uh, what the Shema was, well, you can go over to Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 4, and the Shema is something that they, uh, that they repeat daily. The Shema is, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one. And you're to love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your might. And, and we know that verse. And Jesus repeats it. It's called the Shema because the first word in the phrase is hear. Oh, hear, O Israel. Shema. Shema is that word. And we have that beginning in chapter 1, verse 2. And then if you go over to chapter 3, look at chapter 3 for a second, verse 1. And I said, hear now, O heads of Jacob and the rulers of the house of Israel. And then if we go over to chapter 6, chapter 6, uh, verse 1, hear now what the Lord is saying. Hear, Shema, to listen. And these sets off three sections, three distinct sections in this book uh, to the uh, different people or the same people, uh, but different emphasis on the message. So it has three uh, distinct sections in this book and and as we look at this book what what are the themes what are the message here uh, the message is quite clear and these are things that we need to take a heart even though it was focused towards judah and some of it towards israel the message here is god is just his people will be punished but also God is gracious. He is faithful to his covenant and his people. And oftentimes it's the remnant, the remnant of the people will be redeemed and restored. And, and God wants his people to reflect his character. We'll talk about that here in a minute. And Israel and Judah and believing Gentiles will be blessed through the coming Messiah who is to be born where? We know the story, the Christmas story. Where is Jesus born? In Bethlehem. And it's prophesied over in chapter 5, verse 2. And the leader, the new leader, this Messiah, will be like Yahweh. Be like Yahweh. And we read about that in chapter 7, those very last uh, few verses there. And we will get to that in a few minutes. Uh, as a key verse to the whole book, the key verse to the whole book we find in chapter 1. Chapter 1, verses, uh, uh, verses 8 and 9. Verses 8 and 9. And, and we read these words, and this is, this is Micah talking. He says, because of this, I must lament and wail. He, 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 he's understanding what's coming here. He says, I must go barefoot and naked. I must make a lament against the jackals in the morning like the ostriches, for who, her wound is incurable. Talking about the sin of his people. The wound is incurable, for it, incurable, for it has come to Judah. It has reached the gate Gates, the gate of my people, even to Jerusalem. Remember, this was made 150 years before, at least 150 years, uh, perhaps as many as 200 years before Jerusalem fell, and a few years, certainly a few years before uh, Israel fell to the Assyrians, Jerusalem fell to the Babylonians. And, and so he's talking about judgment that's coming. And so let's go through uh, uh, through this book, and we'll cover each chapter very briefly. Uh, uh, chapter 1, there's coming a time when men who have persisted in sin is going to face ruin 
and ruin without any remedy. God cannot help them because they will not repent. And reformation, they, they cannot, they, they refuse to repent from their sins. Judgment is coming. Look at Micah 1, verses 3 and 4. For behold, the Lord is coming forth from his place. He will come down and tread on the high places of the earth. The mountains will melt under him. The valley will be split and wa like wax before the fire, like water pour down a steep place. Uh, it's talking about what is coming. Now, some of that uh, has obvious direct reference to when Jesus comes his second time. But as we look at verses 6 through 16, it's describing the Syrian invasion, the invasion from Assyria and Israel. And, and, it, and, and it gives rise to the prophecy of even greater invasion in the last days and Christ's deliverance after Armageddon. And we read about that over in Revelation 16 and Revelation 19. That moves us on to chapter 2. Chapter 2 is, uh, a, a, as we read through there, it's uh, uh, sinners cannot expect rest in the land which they have polluted uh, by their sins against God. For he will certainly, he will certainly bring his severe judgments. With every threatening of judgment, however, there is a promise of mercy. There is a promise of mercy for a remnant. There's always a few uh, that God will save. There's always a few that recognizes the sin and will turn back to him, to a remnant who will acknowledge their king and walk in their ways. Look at uh, verse 1, ch uh, Micah chapter 2, verse 1. Woe! You got to pay attention every time you read woe in the Bible. Uh, it reminds me of the woes of Jesus over in Matthew. Uh, but woe, he says in verse 1, woe to those who scheme iniquity, who work out evil on their beds, and when morning come, they do it, for it is in the power of their hands. Uh, verse 7, it is being said, O house of Jacob, is the spirit of the Lord impatient? Are these his doing? Do not my works do good uh, to the one who walks uprightly? There, there are things that are going to happen because people refuse to repent. Uh, uh, verse 10, arise and go, for this is no place of rest because of the uncleanliness that brings on destruction. Key word here is destruction. That very last line in verse 10, a painful destruction, a sore destruction in some translations. Uh, uh, verses uh, 12 to 13 talks about, uh, but he will, Christ the King, who will come again after, uh, in the last days, we're talking Armageddon here, he says in 12, he says, I will surely assemble all of you, Jacob. I will surely gather the remnant of Israel, put them together like sheep in the fold, like a flock in the midst of its pasture, and they will be noisy with men. The breaker goes up before them. They will break out pass through the gate and go out by it. So their king goes on before them and the Lord at their head as they, as they go. Uh, chapter 3 begins a new section. Verse 1, hear now. And I said, hear now, O heads of Israel. Uh, men cannot expect to do will and fare well because they are simply recognized of, uh, as being religious. Uh, we see that today. I go to church on Sunday. I sing the hymns. I raise my hands, and I live like the devil for the rest of the week. We can't expect to do well and fare well just because we go through the motions of being religious. The time will come that those who have shown no mercy shall have judgment without mercy. God will hide his face when they are sorely in need of his favor. Look at verse 4, Micah 3, verse 4. Then they will cry out to the Lord, but he will not answer them. Instead, he will hide his face from them at that time because they have practiced evil deeds. We can't expect God to hear our cries when we are living evil during the week. Look at verse 8. On the other hand, 
I am filled with power, with the Spirit of the Lord, with justice and courage, to make known to Jacob his rebellious act, even to Israel his sin. God will point out our sin, rest assured. Chapter 4, chapter 4. Uh, talking about the future kingdom of Christ on the earth. Uh, some of these other prophecies have come about. These have yet to come. Some of these have yet to come. In the last days of the age, the kingdom of Christ will be manifest on the earth uh, that no king, that no kingdom has ever had. It will be a kingdom universal, peaceful, prosperous, uh, and the increase of Christ's government will have no end, and peace there shall be no end. Uh, Israel, long dispersed and scattered around the world, will be brought back and have a place of glory on the earth, recognizing Israel will recognize Christ, Jesus Christ, as their king. Look at verse 1, and it will come about in the last days. We're quickly approaching those last days, even now, that the mountain of the house of the Lord will be established as the chief of the mountains. What mountains is that of the house of the Lord? That's none other than the temple mount in Israel. When we talk about the mountain of the Lord, we talk about Zion, uh, we talk about his holy hill, we're referring to the temple mount in Jerusalem, and that's where Jesus will have his throne. He says, the mountain of the house of the Lord will be established as chief of the mountains. It will be raised above the hills and people will stream to it. Many nations will come and say, these are the last times. These are in the, in the millennium that will follow the tribulation after Christ comes again. Many nations will come and say, come, let us go to the mountain of the Lord and to the house of the God of Jacob that he may teach us about his ways, that we may walk in his path. Uh, for from Zion will go forth the law, even the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. He will judge between many peoples and render uh, decisions for mighty distant nations. They will hammer their swords into plowshares. Boy, where have we read that before? Isn't that over in Isaiah? Uh, uh, they will they will hammer their swords into plowshares, their spears and the pruning hooks. Nation will not lift up sword against nation, and never again will they train for war. Each of them will sit under his vine and under his fig tree with no one to make them afraid, for the mouth of the Lord of hosts has spoken. Though the people, uh, though all the people walk, each in the name of his God, as for us, we will walk in the name of the Lord our God forever and ever. We're talking about the time yet to come, that time in the millennium when Jesus will be here, when peace will be throughout the earth. And, and it's, it has yet to take place, but that time is coming. Chapter 5, talking about the coming of the Messiah. Now, this is his first coming, his first coming but also we're going to look at a second coming. you got to remember, in the Old Testament, when none of these things have happened, and of course the second coming hasn't happened yet, they're looking at things in the distance, and they're seeing the mountains, but they're not seeing the valleys in between. All they can do, they see the mountains, and, and they're grouping it all together. Well, we have Jesus' first coming, and then we've got at least a couple thousand years before his second coming. But it's like mountains in the distance that we can't tell that from their perspective as he writes. Look at verse 2, Micah 2, Micah 5, verse 2. And, and it says, but as for you, Bethlehem Ephrathah, too little to be among the clans of Judah, but from you will go forth for me to be ruler in Israel. His going forth are from long ago, from days of eternity. Talking about Jesus being born in Bethlehem. Therefore, he will give them up until a time when she who is in labor has born a child. Interesting, go over in chapter 12 of uh, Revelation, read about Israel referred to as the one giving birth to a child who, who the devil is after. Uh, we read about it over there. Uh, then the remainder of his brethren will return to the sons of Israel 
verse 4, he will arise and shepherd his flock. He's talking about his second coming. In the strength of the Lord and in the majesty of the name of the Lord his God, and they will remain. Right now we know they're scattered. They're all coming back to Israel now. It started back in 1948, actually before that, but Israel became a nation in 1948. And in the majesty of the name of the Lord his God, and they will remain because at that time, he, speaking of Jesus, he will be great to the ends of the earth. And look at just the first part of verse 5. This one, notice one is capitalized. This one will be our peace, talking about his millennial reign. And then it goes on talking about, okay, now we're shifting gears. When Assyria invades our land. Uh, talking about the Son of God. He was to be born into this world as a child of the woman, woman being Israel. To be the savior of the world, he rejected except by a remnant. And then he would be await the consummation of the age uh, at the end of time. And as he comes back again to rule the world. But what's noticed here is Jesus was be born in Bethlehem. In Bethlehem. If you remember, this is what was quoted over in Matthew that was told to the kings who were seeking who is he who was born king of the Jews. Read about that over in Matthew chapter 2. Chapter 6 begins the last section. Begins the last section of, uh, of Micah. Hear now, verse 1, hear now what the Lord is saying. Arise, plead your case before the mountains. Let the hills hear your voice. Uh, God issues a challenge to all who have ever professed belief in him, but have wandered from him. I don't know, that describes a lot of us, doesn't it? Of those who've wandered from him. To testify against him. If they have not found his demands to be reasonable, or if he have not fully paid his accounts. Our ceremonies, our religious worship, the things that we do will be accepted of him. But they've got to be backed by lives that conform to his will. And we need to be in communion with him. Uh, God can't be fooled by ceremony. He can't be fooled by us showing up at church and being ultra-religious on Sunday morning or watching a few religious television shows on TV and hearing some great preaching. Our lives have got to back up our praises or otherwise our praises mean nothing to God. Micah chapter 6, verse 2. Listen, you mountains, to the indictment of the Lord and your enduring foundations of the earth. Because the Lord has a case against his people, even with Israel, he will dispute. Skip down to verse 6. Some familiar verses here. I preached from them a few years ago. He said, with what shall I come to the Lord? and bow myself before the God on high. Shall I come to him with burnt offerings, with yearling calves? Does the Lord take delight in thousands of rams, speaking of sacrifices, 10,000 rivers of oil that would be poured on the altar? Shall I present my firstborn for my rebellious act, the fruit of my body for the sins of my soul? Key verse here, verse 8. He has told you, O oh man, what is good. And what does the re Lord require of you but to do justice, to love kindness, and to walk humbly with your God? How we live through the week has everything to do with our worship on Sunday. Our worship on Sunday must be backed up by righteous and godly living through the week. Chapter 7. Israel's sad present condition and the voice of the remnant in the last days. Sometimes we cry out to the Lord, you know, woe is me. Oftentimes woe is me because of what I've done. I've done it to myself. 
Look at it. Chapter 7, verse 1. Woe is me, for I am like the fruit pickers, like the grave gather, uh, grape gatherers. There is not a cluster of grapes to eat or a ripe fig which I crave. The godly person has perished from the land, and there is no right, upright person among men. All of them lie in wait for bloodshed. Each of them hunts the other with a net. Uh, the thing is, that's the world that we live in. Woe is me. Uh, the sin, and I'm talking about the sin of our people. Killing babies in the womb before they have a chance. Uh, all these things uh, uh, completely putting God out of our midst. One thing that we have to marvel at is God's mercy. What do we read over in Second Peter? Um, God is not slow concerning his problems. He doesn't desire any to perish, but wants all to come unto repentance. Despite what we may have done, those who go to him in repentance will be saved. And we've got to, un we've got to marvel at God's pardoning and his mercy to men and rejoice with the promise that he shall yet reign on this earth. Matt, uh, Micah 7, verse 7. But as for me, I watch expectantly for the Lord. I will wait for the God of my salvation. My God will hear me. And then in verse 9, I will bear the indignation of the Lord because I have sinned against him. Until he pleads my case and execute justice for me, he will bring me out to the light and I will see his righteousness. Uh, over in 1 John uh, chapter 2, verse 2, talks about we have an advocate who has been to propitiation, uh, satisfied God's wrath, if you will, for not only our sins, but the sins of the world. He will bring me out into his light, and I will see his righteousness. And then let's look at those last few verses. Last few verses, namely 18 and 19, we're going to look at. And it says, who is a God like you? Speaking of Jesus, who pardons iniquity and passes over the rebellious act of the remnant of his possessions. You know, not everybody is going to do it. There is a remnant. Even today, in America today, there's a few. There is a few that God will save and he will hear us. And he says, a remnant. He says, the rebellious act, the remnant of his possessions. He does not retain his anger forever because he delights in unchanging love. Verse 19, he will again have compassion on us. He will tre tread our iniquities underfoot. Yes, you will cast all their sins into the depths of the sea. Kind of as the psalmist says, he'll separate our sins as far as the east is from the west. Mike is about judgment. Judgment is coming. But God desires to save. And there will be a remnant that will save and be restored. I pray that we're in among the remnant. This is a message for us as much as it was for the people of Judah in Michael's day. What does the Lord require of you? He has told you, old man, what is good. To do justice, to love kindness, and to walk humbly with your God. Let me close in a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, again, we thank you for your word. We thank you for your great mercies towards us. And Lord, we pray that we might work, walk worthily during the week, that as we come to you together in worship, that our worship will be acceptable because of the way that we live in the week before. Lord, go with us, watch over us, protect us. May all that we say and do will bring honor and glory to Jesus. And we pray all of these things. Amen. I hope to see you on Sunday. If you're unable to worship with us in person, we will be live streaming. Uh, so I hope to see you online. Uh, it'll be posted. Recording will be uh, available later on our website. Uh, but worship this Sunday.
and worship up with us in spirit and online if you can't be physically with us. God bless you all, and I wish you all a good rest of the week.